Okay, great. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and um, uh, let me let me begin by a few uh, very grim statistics. Every 24 seconds, somebody dies in a road crash. Um, that's like equivalent to 15 aircraft crashes every single day. Uh, this is how bad the, the road safety situation globally is. Uh, of course, when we have a plane crash, uh, there are that's a rare event, thankfully, and uh, and there are investigations and improvements done for the industry and guidelines rolled out and and there is a whole uh, mechanism to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Uh, but road crashes are taken much, much more lightly than that. It's just almost unfortunately, it's taken as a way of life now that, well, yeah, there is a certain risk driving on the road. In fact, it is one of the riskiest things that most of us do. Um, young adults uh, uh, between five to 29 years old are more likely to die in a road crash than any other health condition including COVID-19, uh, uh, because they're healthy, it's uh, the biggest health risk that they face is actually driving on the road. Um, and unfortunately, more than half of the fatalities occur between what we call vulnerable road users, um, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists. Uh, developing countries uh, have a disproportionately higher share of fatalities. But actually, no country in the world is immune to this, and and um, everyone is doing kind of uh, has a lot of room for improvement. The reason I called it pandemic is because if you compare it to COVID nineteen last two years, um, uh, the uh, fatalities uh, and the um, and the actual number of cases. Well, uh, the predicted number of road crashes that happened during this time are about half of that. Right, uh, roughly speaking, 2.7 million fatalities in two years, uh, 100 million plus seriously injured uh, in those crashes. So the numbers are roughly half of of the COVID pandemic. But road crashes are not even taken one percent as seriously by by most uh, governments and people and organizations. Uh, and that's uh, something which is uh, quite um, starking in its uh, in, in its impact. So um, uh, and the and like I said, the the situation is equally bad uh, the world over. No, no country is immune from this. Of course, some are doing better than others. Uh, but um, uh, the, the the way we measure fatality rate, uh, typically as a way of comparison globally, is in number of deaths per 100,000 population per year. And you can see the numbers there. Uh, uh, all countries uh, suffer from this, uh, more or less. Uh, there is a renewed interest in this problem uh, over the current decade. The UN has declared this a decade of emergency for road safety. And they are kind of uh, you know, looking towards what are called vision zero programs, because road crashes, uh, note that I don't call them accidents, because there are often uh, specific reasons for a crash to occur, which are all avoidable. Uh, and so many countries are coming up with vision zero programs where they want to reduce road crashes literally down to zero. Uh, there is some new trends that are emerging. And one of them is what uh, Nathan talked about, distracted driving. Uh, in last year, the US has seen the worst traffic, uh, the worst year for traffic crashes uh, since 2006. Uh, so the fatality rate is actually going up. Uh, there were 10% more fatalities compared to the previous year. Uh, pedestrian fatalities, every statistic, pedestrian fatalities went up, cyclist fatalities went up, motorcyclist fatalities went up, multi-vehicle crashes went up, uh, crashes involving trucks, uh, speed-related fatalities, every single uh, statistic went up. And also uh, one in four road crashes now in US have some sort of distracted driving usage of cell phone involved. This is something that is increasing quite dramatically uh, compared to uh, previous years. Uh, you can see the trend line there, it's increasing uh, very, very uh, highly. And uh, and we actually saw during the pandemic actually a, a trend worldwide uh, that the cell phone usage while driving has increased. And it's now considered even more dangerous than speeding, which used to be the top uh, the top cause of fatalities. 
um, uh, people are taking uh, Zoom meetings while driving or 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 getting on on their work with office and so on. And these trends are just coming out and they're causing a lot of concern. Uh, what are the driver behaviors that cause crashes? There are a lot of uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, speeding uh, is known to aggravate crashes, jumping red lights, distracted driving, reckless driving, sudden lane changes. That's a big one. Going on a highway and and realizing, oh, I need to take that exit, and then just going across maybe two lanes to to do that. That's a, that, that causes a lot of crashes on 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 motorways and highways. Uh, poor lane dis discipline. Uh, not wearing a seatbelt or a helmet, uh, drunk driving, and so on. So there are lots and lots of causes. Uh, and these are the ones that are attributable to drivers, but then there is uh, poor weather. Uh, there is also sometimes structural um, uh, engineering things, uh, the road design or something that contributes to higher crashes at one side than another. Um, there are actually uh, the safety people call fatal four as four biggest reasons that cause uh, either a fatality or a serious injury in a road crash. Uh, the, those are high speed, uh, driver distractions like cell phones, not wearing a seatbelt, and uh, uh, driving under influence. Those are the four big ones that are called uh, the fatal four. Now, uh, it, it has been well established that if uh, enforcement systems are put into place, they do reduce fatalities. Um, uh, the most common enforcement systems has been speed cameras and they have been studied extensively. And while um, some people don't like them, uh, they are considered a nuisance on the road, but it has been well established in study after study that they do reduce uh, fatalities by a very um, significant uh, margin. So speed cameras do make our roads safer. Uh, interestingly, uh, people who are even uh, those who don't like speed cameras, they actually like them in their own neighborhoods. Uh, studies have shown they don't like them elsewhere on the road where they are likely to get caught. Uh, but, but it does have an appreciable impact on the statistics of fatalities. Uh, what are the ways in which these enforcement systems can work or how can roads be made safer um, for everyone? Um, the dominant technologies that are there on the streets are actually quite old now. Uh, traffic radars were invented in 1960s. They work for speeding or red light offenses, and they try to kind of uh, mitigate that behavior uh, through enforcement. Uh, LIDAR devices are laser-based 3D sensing devices that were that came about in the traffic industry in the 1990s. Uh, inductive loops embedded in the road give statistics about the total volume of traffic or the total counts and so on. Uh, they are also very important. Uh, they have been around since the 1960s. And traffic CCTV cameras, which kind of take traffic video feeds and get them to a control room where traffic managers can look at those and make changes in real time, maybe change VMS signs or um, or direct traffic uh, towards uh, less uh, congested pathways uh, have also been quite popular. Uh, but there has been, uh, I would say, uh, quite a few shortcomings of these technologies also. Uh, so for example, if we look at uh, traffic radars, they have quite limited features. They typically cover only speeding and red light offenses and not all the other types of dangerous behaviors that I talked about earlier. Uh, they are also quite expensive to uh, deploy a single four-way intersection red light enforcement system can cost like up to a million dollars in US. And, uh, and so very few lower income countries have uh, benefited from these technologies. Uh, and also, uh, despite their high expense, they have quite a few shortcomings. They have difficulty detecting slow moving objects like pedestrians or cyclists or smaller lower vehicles. Uh, they suffer from challenges in tunnels uh, and, and in many other cases. Uh, in fact, making sense of a radar signal is not so easy. People think of in the traffic industry, they think of them as very accurate devices, but uh, radars uh, 
get a lot of reflections from uh, road furniture and trees and so on and they can they 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 actually um, have difficulty clearly making out vehicles or or especially when when the road gets very congested so so they have uh, operating limitations all right. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, I'll come to the new promise of video analytics. They have There have been two fundamental uh, kind of technological advances uh, that open up possibilities of much richer traffic sensing than what has been available for the last uh, 40, 60 years. Um, one of them is obviously what are now called deep neural networks. I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, the first papers talking about such networks came up in 2012. Uh, and since then, um, since I would say 2016 onwards, they have been heavily productized and they are generating new and amazing results every day. And what they have done is just made video analytics much, much more powerful than what it used to be, uh, because it's not very easy to make sense of images, but these networks have really uh, done a very uh, fundamentally good job at that. And the second technological advancement is the availability of edge processors, uh, very tiny supercomputers, I would say, that have the ability to run these deep neural networks in a very um, uh, fast way. So, uh, so, um, so they are optimized to run these deep neural networks. Now, if you put these two together, what you get is the possibility of another type of traffic sensor, which is a camera that can that can analyze video the same way as humans can do. Uh, the processor is typically embedded inside the camera or quite close to it, so we call that edge processing. Uh, but it opens up the possibility of a very advanced and feature-rich and future-proof traffic analytic system. I call it future-proof because now all the sensing is moving into software rather than the hardware sensing of radars and LIDAR types of devices or inductive loops. Um, a camera is a much lower cost device. It's very easy to put up. You don't have to do any civil works or dig the road up and so on. Um, I will play... Um, a video to show you uh, how powerful uh, this sensing can be in very congested and challenging solutions. You literally, from the just the pixel values in the image, you can you can literally pick up every vehicle and motorbike and pedestrian uh, and and other aspects of traffic which are important, and use that to analyze uh, what's going on on the road and 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 come up potentially with a very very rich analytics. Uh, not just for enforcement, but for all types of traffic use cases. And I'm showing you examples of poor weather, fog, um, uh, degradation in image quality, uh, rain, uh, nighttime images. Um, uh, it's just um, as a as a pra practitioner in the field, uh, I've been working on uh, computer vision problems for um, good more than 20 years, and it's just amazing what is now possible uh, compared to the sort of algorithms which were available previously. Okay, so uh, with that, what I would do like to do is give a very quick uh, introduction to how that is made possible. Uh, what is the revolution that deep neural networks have done, and uh, and and how do those things become possible? Before I jump back to the traffic problem, so essentially, an image is a grid of pixels, right? Uh, uh, you can think of it as a grid with a value, with a number, which is the pixel value in in each of those cells. And what you are trying to do in any such uh, problem is uh, you're going to try to learn a function mapping, a mathematical function, which is essentially what deep neural networks are uh, at its core. You try to find a mathematical function that will map this grid of pixels to a label, to an object. This is a car or a person or a, or a cyclist. So you want to learn a transfer function that will that will look at a pixel, uh, the grid of pixels and, and say what it is. Right, and and that is just a mathematical function uh, mapping, um, and how that's done is essentially what you do is you connect these pixels, like I'm showing in this image. You connect these pixels to another grid, 
typically another smaller grid. And by connecting them, what I'm what what I essentially mean is again a mathematical function. You you take the pixel value and yeah, you know, on each one of these links you have a weight. So you multiply the pixel value by the weight, uh, and then you add them all up at this point. So it's just multiplication of the value with a weight here, uh, with, with some sort of weight, and then you add them up. Uh, you add them for all of these nine pixels, and that's the result that you write here in this smaller grid. So you map, so you transfer, you map this grid into another grid, and that's how you fill all the values here. Uh, this original one is your image, and this becomes kind of like a smaller image, which is which is made up of a combination of those nine pixels. They are added in some weighted way. Now you do the same thing for the next nine pixels, and the next one, and you keep doing that, and that's how one by one you are able to fill in the next grid, and then you go to the next row, do the same thing all over again for each of those groups of nine pixels that you can get. And then you go to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. So ultimately you get a lot of connections. Uh, you, can, you can appreciate how much time it took me to draw all these lines, <laughs> but, but that's essentially what a neural network is. Now, what does the network do when we say we are training the network we are trying to learn the weights so that I get the correct output, all right? Uh, essentially, you're gonna do this step again, uh, map that grid that you got, the new one, into another smaller one. And this is, these sorts of layers is what we call the depth of the network. And so deep neural networks are just very, very big networks like this, that's all. Uh, and essentially, in the input, you will give the image. You have to learn these weights so that you get the correct mappings. What, what do I mean by correct mappings? If you look at a car, it should say, well, this is a car. If you look at a, uh, if you look at a dog, it should say, this is a dog. There should be an output which should say, which would become high if it's a dog, and the other output would become high if it's a car. And which weights will do that? That's the whole trick of learning the network. And we have some algorithms for that to do that so that so that we can essentially learn the right weights to map the right input to the right output. And so essentially what would happen is you have a you have a car here. Uh, it would go through all those smaller and smaller stages, which are shown as like tiny images here. Uh, but in the end, my output for the car should be the highest number. And for truck, aeroplane, ship, or horse, or all the other categories should be should be lower. Um, and and if the network is trained, it it gets to do that incredibly well. And that's what I kind of showed you in the video before. Um, uh, okay, I I have a I have a question here from Cynthia. I think I can take that. Uh, when they overlap, that is uh, give it a higher accuracy. Yes, indeed. Uh, there are there are many many tricks here of how much overlap to do, how how many stages to have, how many of these layers to have, uh, how to train it efficiently, and so on. Uh, but uh, but yes, all of those combined uh, tend to give it very high visual recognition capabilities. Uh, so we can detect all sorts of objects by training these networks. So um, so uh, so for example, here I'm showing you. Uh, what are quite varied images. Uh, some of them are daytime, nighttime, poor weather, different camera angles. Uh, our brain does these things seamlessly. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to appreciate how difficult this task is for a computer to do. Uh, but deep neural networks are the best tool out there right now, uh, by far the best tool out there right, right now to do these sorts of uh, computations. And each of the boxes in these images that I show you 
have been put there by a similar calculation of, of what I gave insight on. Okay, so now with these, we can tackle a lot of problems. So for example, uh, when I talked about radar and LIDAR devices before, uh, they can only detect vehicles, but they can't tell if a driver is distracted or they are not wearing their seatbelt, which again are two of the big fatal four uh, reasons of, uh, of fatalities in road crashes. Um, here I'm showing you output of a system we built, which uh, which is essentially a camera mounted on the roadside looking at two lanes. Uh, we, we kind of get an image of every vehicle which is passing in front of our camera. Our neural network is trained to look for whether the person is not just not just where the car is, it detects where the vehicle is, then it detects where the driver is inside the vehicle, but then it detects whether the driver appears to be distracted by using a cell phone or not. Um, and that's something, uh, this is one of the, I would say, newest technologies to be able to tackle that problem because, uh, because uh, the older traffic sensing technologies uh, just uh, did not cater to these types of uh, behaviors. Um, so I'm showing you um, a lot of different images here captured uh, by our system, uh, but there is like uh, one thing common in each of these images, and that is that each of the drivers has a cell phone in their hand. And that is, uh, if you if you look across the images and you see uh, that feature, uh, that sort of image structure in pixels of where uh, the hand of the driver is and they're holding a cell phone, that is essentially what the neural network has learned. The neural network has learned out of all the pixels that it is seeing, it has learned uh, from that training process, the right weights on those edges to find out uh, that this is the gesture of interest. The person holding a cell phone in the hand is the gesture of interest because that's where the positive output was, uh, was identified in the training data and all the other vehicles where this gesture doesn't happen it's just going to discard those okay uh, and so you can do a lot of different things with this type of core technology and in fact we are kind of doing that uh, you can of course apply them for traffic enforcement applications but also for driver education uh, applications so one of the products that we have built is we connect this sort of uh, distracted driving camera that uh, to a sign uh, that says as soon as it's detected it says please buckle up so it's kind of giving drivers feedback that we see you this is similar to uh, you might have seen uh, speed signs which say your speed is uh, 50 uh, and and if it's above the speed threshold um, the sign can change color or something. Uh, and those sorts of signs are have been known, the speed signs have been known to be one of the most effective strategies in reducing speeding because when a, uh, when a driver sees that their speed is displayed on the sign, they kind of uh, take it as, uh, uh, as a psychological thing that uh, they are being watched and they try to kind of uh, reduce their speed. So we call that traffic calming and, and these signs are very effective. So we have come up with a similar traffic calming device, but for other two of the fatal four, the seatbelt and the mobile phone thing. Uh, also, these uh, the, uh, the, the same software can be used for very fast incident detection and alerts, which are again, very important for safety. If there is a stranded vehicle on a, on a bridge or in a tunnel uh, that is likely to cause a crash very quickly uh, if it's not removed from there. So those are called incident detection and alerts. Uh, near miss statistics are also a very, very interesting uh, part of the whole equation because uh, these um, give you an indication of how risky a particular location is, even without uh, uh, having the data for crashes at that site, which happen more infrequently. But just having a few days of data from 
from a site and and seeing how many near misses have happened uh, not crashes but near misses uh, actually gives a very strong proxy of how many crashes are likely to happen there uh, and bicycle and pedestrian safety the same sort of software can detect pedestrians and bicycles and again detect near misses with them and 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 that that has implications on improving design or signage or so on so you can get quantitative data on traffic safety now very very easily uh, just with uh, just with cameras and this uh, type of advanced software um, i'm showing you a few uh, events uh, picked up by our software. The top two are, uh, are red light running events. Um, those are, uh, the, the camera can kind of detect what's the state of the red light. Is it red, yellow, or green? And then see whether a vehicle has gone through. Again, a very risky behavior that frequently results in crashes. Uh, but we can do more uh, complicated things. So this uh, bottom left video, uh, there is a lane that has a green light, so you are allowed to go straight. And then the second lane has a red light, so you're not allowed to return right. Uh, the driver tried to avoid the detection system by going straight on the green lane and then turning uh, right. And, and because we analyze the whole trajectory of the whole path of the vehicle, we can kind of determine that. Or uh, different uh, turning violations or dangerous events. So for example, here, the left lane in the last video here, the left lane was for turning left only, and the driver kind of uh, made, uh, uh, changed their mind and went straight through. Uh, basically any type of motion behavior uh, can be detected, uh, and 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 we can set rules to determine what's dangerous. Uh, rapid lane changes or um, speeding, even even speeding is possible uh, from video devices. Um, essentially, the software is an edge based uh, solution. This is also very important to bring the cost down because you don't have to dig fiber all the way. Uh, to the um, uh, to the camera, which adds to the cost. We don't need any civil works. You can just stick a, any camera on the roadside and put this processor unit uh, next to it, which contains the software. And you can think of these types of softwares as um, as a video event detection software. So it's basically consuming the video feed that is coming in live into the system and immediately generating an alert if one of the predefined event rules uh, kind of triggers up. Uh, so, so that's essentially what the software is doing. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, uh, people talk about uh, privacy in these situations, obviously, and this type of edge software is one of the most uh, kind of privacy preserving things that can be done because it does not capture uh, an offense if, uh, I mean, all the video is um, kind of consumed there at the edge, and it's not saved unless there is a uh, there is a offense or a violation event or a life threatening situation or something like that. And it's only in those cases that the uh, that the evidence is saved, and the rest of it is just destroyed at the edge. And even in that, uh, now uh, uh, there are requirements coming in that. Uh, the same video analytics software without anybody having viewed the video can blur faces or even blur license plates or change license plates into a secure hashtag so that uh, so that anybody else looking at that data later cannot uh, cannot kind of view it. So all those protections can be built in. Uh, I will very briefly in the end talk about some of the challenges that uh, that this sort of software development kind of has. Uh, the first obviously is the accuracy challenge. You have to have um, very high precision. You cannot be, uh, because in enforcement applications, uh, somebody will be fined for a uh, for an offense. So uh, that can only be done if there is a very high guarantee of accuracy and, and that uh, many countries have uh, regulatory uh, guidelines on uh, regulatory kind of approval processes on any any equipment which which can work in that enforcement mode. And so that that is uh, uh, for for us building such a software that is definitely a challenge. Uh, but the second one is uh, even bigger than that, which is a generalization challenge. So uh, remember you are training these networks and these training is done uh, typically with some, 
uh, with some training data where where the results are already known, uh, already labeled, and and with the challenge is that you don't have when it goes into the field when it goes into a product it will not be limited by the same sort of viewpoints that you might have in your training data or the same type of camera it has to work on many different camera types on many different camera angles heights pan um, tilt views uh, it's going to be looking for different types of traffic conditions traffic in one country is very different from traffic in another country and the challenges and the patterns are quite different and then it has to work 24 hours day night in all sorts of uh, shadows and snow and different uh, angles and in different types of weather so that's actually quite uh, quite a challenge and and we have some uh, proprietary technology that we have developed which uh, which uses um, synthetic training data rather than lots and lots of real world data to kind of significantly help with generalization um, uh, the third uh, challenge is the localization challenge and but what i mean by that is that uh, the vehicles have to be measured very accurately on the ground if you want to measure their speed or tailgating or accident alerts or near miss detection very uh, accurately and so uh, one of the things that we do in our software is not just use a neural network to detect where the vehicle is but we also use a different type of neural network to detect the 3d orientation and position of the of the vehicle uh, and and i'm illustrating why that is important by this figure here so uh, if you have a, if you have a just a two dimensional rectangle a bounding box around the vehicle like what i was showing before um, you you will let's say this vehicle here which is marked in red uh, you will actually be getting this sort of data from which the inference has to be made of whether this vehicle is doing something wrong or not. Uh, and the same box in a different location in the image will have a different orientation of the vehicle. And that's always that's not always so clear. And it makes inference difficult, which lane the vehicle is exactly in and, and what it is doing uh, is uh, is difficult in 2D. But in 3D sensing technology that we have built, and I'm playing a video to illustrate that, you notice that these boxes are kind of like the ground footprint of the vehicle, which lane the vehicle is in is very clearly marked in these rather than the 2D bounding box. And that's why we can uh, cover with a single camera uh, a wide angle multiple lanes and still get very very accurate localization of these vehicles and that's kind of like um, one of the key things that needs to be done if accurate traffic sensing has to uh, uh, has to be achieved um, i'll show you how uh, just in the next slide how this data is uh, in 3D. So if you look at the left image now, that's the original video coming in. And the right one is a rendering of that same data in, in three dimensions. And that's something uh, that we can now achieve in the real time yeah, at the edge uh, very, very accurately. And that gives a lot of understanding of what is the difference uh, distance between the vehicles. Uh, are there any near miss events happening? Uh, what's the speed orientation of each vehicle, uh, which was not possible with 2D uh, analytics. Um, here's a different kind of visualization of the same concept, uh, but if you notice now, we have three-dimensional boxes on each vehicle, and that allows us to measure the length, width, and height of the vehicle also. So is it a truck or a bus or a car? That, that sort of thing can be done, but also where its wheels are. Is it straddling two lanes? Uh, is it doing something uh, dangerous? Uh, those things can be inferred much more robustly with this sort of data. And finally, the last thing is the engineering challenge. The engineering challenge is that uh, when you are building a product out of these neural networks, uh, which has to work in the field on the edge, um, most of the software development that you have to do, you have to do is on non machine learning issues and non AI issues. You have to have a product pipeline, which where you can efficiently train, uh, make everything work on the edge. 
make multiple cameras work together potentially to get a full understanding of the intersection, uh, make the, your product available on a variety of platforms, um, and also uh, ensuring that uh, the, the software that you have built doesn't require very frequent maintenance because that's something typically not allowed in the industry uh, because once you get an approval for a system, you you can't be, uh, if you do updates to the software, that's typically understood to require fresh approval in this industry. So that requires uh, having a long-term view of what are going to be the requirements for the next five to 10 years and building that into your product uh, at that moment. Uh, so finally, I will uh, I will summarize by this slide. I talked about the fatal four in traffic safety: uh, speeding, uh, distracted driving, not wearing a seatbelt, and uh, driving under influence. Um, with the radar and leader technologies that were there before and which have been predominantly deployed in in uh, North America and Europe and Middle East areas. Uh, they can cater to only speeding right now. Uh, there was no technology to do uh, just a couple of years back. There was no technology to sense distracted driving or, or seatbelt offenses, which are incredibly important for safety. Um, driving under influence, there is still no remote sensing technology for that. For that, a uh, cop has to stop the person and do uh, uh, an impairment test. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the kind of clues for dangerous driving can still be picked up. So it, potentially if somebody is kind of uh, uh, weaving in the lane and changing lanes frequently or stopping at a place where it's not, so all of those are warning signs that can, that can trigger some sort of response from the uh, from the traffic managers or traffic authorities. Um, cameras have the capability to cater all of these scenarios or most of these scenarios in the most flexible way. So it's the most flexible and powerful traffic sensor going forward. And, and I think that we are gonna see a much more uh, were much more global and, and increased implementation of cameras for traffic safety if vision zero goals are to be met. So if the current trends continue, um, 13 million people will, will die in this decade uh, in road crashes, unfortunately. Um, we don't want those tr current trends to continue. And so our view is that we want to engineer solutions that are so... Uh, affordable, so easy to use, uh, so feature rich and, 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 and safe that uh, a camera at every intersection becomes possible. Just like we are used to having traffic lights at every intersection, which is also a traffic safety device, and it's just standard that they should be there uh, or a stop sign. Uh, similarly, we, uh, we believe that there is a future where um, almost every intersection, these type of equipment will be thought of as standard. And it's only AI that can make that possible because it gives smart, affordable, and comprehensive traffic sensing. Uh, I'll stop here, thank you so much. I've put my email here on this, uh, on this slide also uh, for anybody who wants to contact me later, but of course I'm available now for questions and answers. So over to you, Nathan. Awesome, thank you, Sahib. Uh, so let's answer a couple of questions um, this one that I'm going to ask has a couple of different parts to it, and I think you may have already answered part of it, but we're going to ask the whole thing anyways. So this is from Peter, and Peter says, the demo showing the object, object detection slash tracking is so impressive. Two questions coming out of this. The first, are these detections done by a single custom trained object detector or multiple detector for different perspectives of cameras, which I think you sort of answered, but I'll let you take that first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and uh, and uh, and uh, I, I, uh, when we started off uh, first building this software, we were exactly doing what Peter is referring to. We were we were doing uh, custom trainings for each camera type and each camera viewpoint. So so what we used to do was we had kind of like a base model which was trained on a lot of different viewpoints, but to get to a very high performance level 
we would do a small child model, a little bit of additional training for that particular situation. Uh, that's not uh, very scalable because everywhere you go install a new camera, you need to collect some data from that camera and do it. And it's really uh, now the, the results that I showed you are actually running on the same production uh, uh, network. Mm -hmm. So uh, So that's the... That's the thing that uh, that's what I meant by the generalization challenge that you want to get to a performance level where uh, the same out of the box network works for a lot of different uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the follow up question to that was if it is a single model, does it generalize well? Um, yeah, indeed, that that is that is what we are quite uh, uh, excited about that uh, the generalization challenge needs specific work and 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 all the results that i was showing you uh in that video which had many different uh, uh many different kind of perspectives and weather conditions and so on all of those were running from the same production detector right and then the second question um which again i think you also answered uh, at the end here was um are these wonderful is this wonderful work done by edge ai boxes or cloud side of tpus what is the yeah. overall throughput of them in FPS? Yeah, so uh, again, a great question. Uh, all of the products that we built are uh, 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 the seatbelt and mobile phone and this other vehicle detections, which, which lead to um, scenarios like red light or band turns or other things. All of them are, are working on the edge. Um, so uh, so uh, we think that edge is the way to go. Uh, because um, the bandwidth requirements, the privacy requirements, the uh, the performance requirements, uh, the installation costs, all of those are minimized uh, by the edge. Uh, of course, uh, the same software can potentially work on the server side, and we have done that for some of our customers who already have a video going to the to the to the cloud. Um, it's a containerized application, so it can more or less be dropped onto a different kind of configuration. Uh, but uh, but it's the edge use case that excites us the most, and 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 we are really a big proponent of uh, putting these on the edge because that carries a lot of uh, benefits. Uh, your question about throughput, uh, it, it again depends on which hardware we use, and often there is a cost to throughput kind of customizations. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we easily reach real time frame rates on on a lot of uh, the available uh, commodity hardware uh, on like jets and devices and so on uh, in fact uh, in fact on the higher end devices we can process more than one camera feed simultaneously all right and then this next question is from gabriella um, what other driver distractions is the technology able to sense um, can it for instance, if the driver's uh, turned looking at the back seat, um, or is it mainly just the four uh, challenges that you mentioned? Uh, yes, uh, that's again a great question. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the one that we have built is focused on seat belt and mobile phone. Uh, but we are seeing a lot of interest in, in uh, the industry on some other use cases also. So for example, child seat safety is, is a, are our uh, our kids in in the proper child seat or not uh, has been talked about a lot. Um, there are um, uh, uh, there are uh, what you mentioned. If the driver's uh, gaze is not on the road, that's actually from the viewpoint that we are working with, which is a pole mounted camera looking from a distance. It's actually very very difficult, and I don't see. Um, it can be done uh, realistically uh, to a high accuracy level. However, there is a whole uh, part of um, uh, industry which is working with uh, uh, in-vehicle cameras. Uh, these are typically used for trucking fleets or, or other types of utility vehicles where they have a, a camera mounted inside the vehicle which is uh, typically two cameras, one looking towards the road and the other looking towards the driver. And it can beep or sound an alarm uh, when the driver takes their gaze off the road. Uh, of course, that's that's a technology that has to be voluntary. It has to be put in by the vehicle owner. Uh, and I, I think uh, a lot of trucking fleets are now putting that sort of technology in. 
Um, so, so at that distance, when the camera is close by, you can track gaze very, very accurately from from uh, uh, neural networks. And so, if the driver turns their head away for uh, a long time, it can generate a beep. It can also record that event for training purposes later or for logging purposes. Uh, there is another category of uh, devices, uh, some very good ones that have come out. Uh, which look at the distance to the next vehicle. Uh, they, they are looking outside the cabin uh, on the road, and they can also alert if there is, let's say, a pedestrian detected or if if the vehicle is tailgating. And, and there have been studies now by some companies showing that they uh, improve the safety of driving a lot because if a driver consistently gets that feedback, uh, some companies, uh, some trucking fleets have tied the, that to a point-based bonus system. So if you drive more safely uh, and this device can detect that, uh, it it kind of uh, reflects in some sort of reward or bonus uh, for the drivers. And that has improved uh, safety training of the drivers a lot. So there are a lot of possibilities in terms of training devices, in terms of uh, these types of things. Okay, perfect. And and then uh, next question kind of goes back to the 13 million people uh, will die in road crashes by 2030. And you said that was um, this decade, right? Yeah, that's for the 10 years. Uh, it's uh, 1.35 million fatalities every year. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what the number uh, is from, uh, from um, the World Health Organization data. Okay. So um, we still have a little time left. So I am actually going to steal the screen from you and I'm going to introduce tomorrow's webinar. And I know that we received a couple questions about how to view the recording. So I'll share that as well. And so, hey, we'll see if any other questions um, pop up while I do this. And then we'll, we'll go back and answer those and then, and then wrap up. So um, yeah, there is another good question here. I can kind of dig that. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so did, did you face the latency issues? How did you overcome if you faced them and, uh, you know, like model optimization or, or something else? Yeah, uh, uh, Sharma, uh, latency is very important and uh, especially, especially in some applications where we need to have a live trigger, let's say to a flash uh, to capture the license plate maybe or where we have two cameras working in synchronization in real time. Uh, we often do that. And so uh, latency is pretty important. Um, for, the, for the white flash triggering mechanisms, there's often kind of like a tough uh, requirement in milliseconds. It has to work within this many milliseconds, otherwise the vehicle will go away into a different position. And, and, the, uh, and the kind of quick answer to that is it depends on the compute power available. So whatever latency requirement is there, we kind of uh, scope the hardware appropriately. Perfect, all right. Now I'm gonna share my screen and we'll see if any more questions pop in. Go ahead. Okay. So I'll give that a couple seconds to load. Um, all right, so uh, not next week, but tomorrow, this uh, November 30th at 12 p.m. Pacific, uh, we'll, be doing, right, we'll be writing unit tests for data science code. And um, this will be presented by Dr. Niall Wilson. And um, uh, so she's gonna be uh, taking some soft engineering best practices for testing data science code and uh, sharing some common scenarios. And you'll run into this problem uh, when you do a quick Google lookup unit tests, and you're going to run into a lot of information about software engineering, but find very little guidance for when you're doing for your data science code. So uh, this is what Dr. Nal Wilson is going to be um, uh, taking us through. Uh, uh, Dr. Wilson is a data and applied scientist in industry solutions engineering in Microsoft, and that is a mouthful of a job title. <laughs> so um, uh, come with, come see us tomorrow, November 30th at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern um, to learn about writing unit tests for your data science code. And then I know we had some questions about um, how do we find the, the recording of the presentation? I know uh, our friend Raja uh, posted a URL uh, datasciencedoja.com slash tutorials. Uh, you can also go to datasciencedoja.com slash events where you can find all of our upcoming events. And then if you click this tab here to the past, 
Uh, you can find all of our past events as well. And we will have um, uh, this event, um, uh, Saving Lives Behind the Wheel, we'll have that up as soon as processing is done. Um, I usually estimate about a day, um, sometimes less. And then um, if, if you RSVP'd on our website, uh, we will also be sending you an email with, with the recording attached. So just keep an eye on this, this web page here. I'll post it in chat for everyone on Zoom and my team will can post it in the chats for, um, uh, oh, I only sent it to hosts and panelists. There we go. My team will send it to, um, uh, uh, on, the, on the live streams. So if you wanna click find past events, just click that past tab and it'll be there. All right, so so hey, but I'm not seeing any other questions coming in, um, and I'm not seeing any on LinkedIn either. So uh, I think we are good to end here. So thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate you taking some time, and I know it's late over in Saudi Arabia right now, so we appreciate you also staying up late with us. Um, for those of you who joined us today, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know we we really like seeing your questions and and having you. Uh, participate in these sessions with us and a big thank you to Fatima Rafiq uh, for setting all this up for us so so hey have a good rest of your night and I hope you know you're you're not too tired in the morning and everyone else have a good rest of their day bye thank you so much I really appreciate your uh, coordination with this webinar and for